Welcome to the Kit Car History File series where we'll be going through the industry's past. We'll be visiting old marks of long ago, some modern ones, some mostly older stuff, a lot of archive information with photographs and information on the cars they made, the people involved and what happened to them. Hi, welcome to the Total Kit Car YouTube channel. My name is Steve Hole, editor of TKC Mag and TotalKitCar.com and I'd like to welcome you along once again to another episode of the Total Kit Car History File series. Uh, first off, <clears throat> time of writing this in early January 2024. Writing this as a magazine veteran for you. At the time of um, recording this in early January 2024, just getting over a bit of a, little, a chest infection, which um, has left me sounding like Darth Vader. So I do apologise for the sound effects that you weren't expecting. So forgive me. Anyway, this episode, we're going to look at... Um, I think the automotive equivalent of the Wombles of Wimbledon Common. Um, overseas listeners, you need to Google that. I'm not going down that rabbit hole. But I will use that um, analogy to describe the outspan orange car, which is what we're covering today. Which, like the Wombles, was a novelty. But very good for promotion and was designed by a very talented serious designer by the name of Brian Waite much like the man behind the Wombles was Mike Batt um, a musical genius if ever there was one um, let's get that out of the way anyway let's look at Brian Waite's career in a little bit of potted history um, alongside that um he was born in Bristol in 1942. His father was a pilot for BOAC, British Overseas Airlines. And um, at age just 15, Brian got an apprenticeship at Aston Martin, as you do. Starting off as a lowly gopher, come tea boy, come butt of all jokes, I suppose. But he learnt a lot very quickly. Um, John Wire was the Aston Martin race team manager back then. And I think he was a hard taskmaster and, and, and pretty scary, I imagine, for a 15-year-old. But it was Formula, former Grand Prix driver Reg Parnell that took young Brian under his wing, really. And definitely saw the potential that he had. And fast-tracked him. So much so that Brian was heavily involved in the very historic um, Le Mans 1-2 finish for D Aston DBR1s um, in 1959. And in the months prior to the race, he was involved in the development team and learnt lots about aerodynamics, working with Aston's chief um, designer, Ted Cutting. And also... Chief Engineer Brian Clayton. So that's not a bad thing to have, have on your CV as a... I think he was 19 um, back then. He stayed with Aston until um, 1961. When he went to work for um, Repco. Um, short for Replacement Parts Company. And if you're over a, short, a certain age, you'll remember the Repco name because they sponsored a pre knighted Jack Brabham's Formula One team and were heavily involved in his motor racing developments operation. Um, and Brian worked there as, a, as an engineer. That company had a lot of his, history in Australia, his native Australia, founded by a chap called jo uh, Jeff Russell in 1922. Um, and yeah, Brian... Worked there for a little while. He reckons he learnt a lot there and enjoyed his time. Um, age 25, Brian set up uh, an eponymous company, Brian Way Enterprises Limited, just before his 25th birthday, actually. Although a lot of his work then was done, um, was on a commission or a retainer to uh, John Wilman, uh, who at that time uh, was running John Wilman Racing. Um, amongst many other amongst many other things, they were a race team, 
they were tuning uh, engine tuning operation and they sold lots of speed parts and m- much like many companies in that uh, in the 60s and uh, they had various branches uh, one at near Southampton um, there was one I believe maybe Chiswick um, Uxbridge Way and the speed shop um, John Wilmot speed shop was in Mitcham in Surrey on the outskirts of, uh, well, between Croydon and uh, Morden, I, um, I guess. Um, and even though Brian, um, Brian was based in Smarden in Kent at that time, um, he spent a lot of time at the uh, Mitcham operation. He, um, when, when John Wilman tried to buy a, a Shelby Daytona Cobra, um, from Shelby American, uh, Carol Shelby wouldn't, for whatever reason, sell him one. So, Wilman thought outside the square and uh, and and got um, and gave Brian a spare two eight nine Cobra chassis and told him to design a car like the Shelby Coupe, Peter Brock design coupe. Um, using that chassis as his as his base. Um, apparently, Shelby American. I'm not too sure why they wouldn't supply him a car, but they did supply them some uh, blueprints for um, some some Daytona coupe um, chassis drawings, and that helped weight um, create the aerodynamic body of what became the Wilmot Coupe. Um, and the intention was to run that car at Le Mans in 64, but that didn't happen. And for whatever reason, it didn't happen in 65 or 66 either. So it was kind of a, a very pretty car. Um, but it, 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 it didn't have anywhere to race, really, other than a few... Well, I think it might have raced other races other than Le Mans, which was the intention. In the end, it just became a very leery a road car but once again Brian says he learnt a lot at um, at Wilmot's um, operation and he did other stuff as well he did lots of other stuff he, there were some special commissions that he did for customers and, and lots of motorsport um, running various drivers and cars including a, a Ford Escort for a notable touring car driver of the day a guy called Mike, Mike Crabtree Although he particularly remembers the times that he worked with um, Jack Sears and really rated him very highly. And then came Knocking, the car that probably, despite the serious stuff in his career that he's done uh, before that, um, a company called, well, the Outspan Organisation came Knocking. And initially they came looking for him to create for them um, some best described as giant oranges that would be fixed to poles. That I guess like um, the 76 oil um, balls that you see in, in by the side of the road in, in, in the US. And I think Outspan wanted something similar to promote their... Um, I, I can always... I can't understand why... Well, all they did really was promote the orange. They didn't really promote... Well, obviously, they did promote themselves, but really and truly, they were promoting oranges in general, surely. But anyway, Brian created them for them, and they were very happy. And that was used at various exhibitions as promotional tool and stuff like that. I think he built several of them. While in the process of doing that job, he became good friends with Outspan's advertising director, a a chap called Jeremy Nightingale. And his girlfriend, um, who was actually a former girlfriend of Mike Hawthorne, no less. But anyway. And what... um, I think the Outspan Orange car came about um, um, a a wine-laden dinner uh, meeting with Outspan's promotional team, from what I understand. And someone suggested what we want is those something like those um, big oranges you designed 
for us, Brian, that had wheels on that we could drive. Cue much laughter. Um, the boss actually heard that and was laughing as much as all the staff, but had a quiet word to Brian and said, you, you, could, you could do that for us, couldn't you? To which Brian replied that he could, but end of the night came um, and he thought nothing more of that and thought it was just a, a bit of a laugh and a bit of a joke. I think from what Brian told me once, about 10 days later, though, um, uh, an official letter from Outspan turned up and lo and behold, inside was an official order for um, a large quantity. Uh, I never did find out what the large quantity actually was in, in terms of numbers, but it was a, a large order, official order on headed paper for some outspan orange cars. What happened then was Brian started to build the prototype. He started it at Smarden, but actually he built the cars at Wilmot's base at Mitcham. Bigger workshop. And um, one fly in the ointment that came along was that the outspan got a new boss um, who wanted to ring the changes a little bit and apparently had a fit he went nuts when he saw um in his in tray uh, the order for x amount of outspan oranges and the development of the same um motorized outspans and went yeah as i say went nuts and he did his best to try and cancel the whole order. Brian, kind of being Brian, told him that that wouldn't be possible. In any case, it was done before he arrived. But they, in the end, they compromised. And so Brian was to build, finish the cut prototype. And six production, <laughs> it even sounds funny saying it, six production outspan orange cars were to be built. Um... The, the the promotional um, activity around those cars was incredible. Um, I remember them um, being everywhere in magazines um, and TV appearances and goodness knows what as a kid um, in the early seventies. He started that, that was they were built between seventy two and seventy four. I should have said, um, and they certainly bought weights and publicity. But it was kind of. I guess it was like Jeff Beck's high ho silver lining that we all know and have heard umpteen times at various New Year's parties and God knows what. Um, Jeff Beck was so, the late great Jeff Beck was so much more than, than that song, although obviously it earned him a lot of money. Um, but he was so much more serious than that in terms of his incredible guitar playing. And likewise, there was so much more to Brian Waite than building motorised oranges. But that's what got him the publicity. And, and I don't suppose it did him any harm. And um, indeed, he's very proud of those cars. Um, I think it's a lot harder to build um, a motorised orange than it is to say it. Um, it wasn't a question of just... I think the initial intention actually was to do just what I said earlier. Cut some holes for windows um, and plonk the, those plastic uh, uh, orange promotional um, oranges that he'd done and just motorised them. But that became pretty, it became pretty apparent from very early on that that was not going to be a goer. So Brian being the engineer that he is, he settled down to work out how he would do it. Um, and as you said, it seemed like a very good idea at the time. He never actually, even though he got loads of publicity, he claims never to have made a lot of money from that. He was just taking it on as a as the promotional the promotional benefit of it, I think. Uh, but what what he actually ended up with was something he's very elaborate, actually. Fiberglass body, moulded uh, in two pieces. Um, but the hardest part was um, the basic chassis that I had to underpin the whole kit and caboodle. He um he did build a space frame, a very tiny space frame. Um, and he did 
base it on uh, on mini and use two subframes the chassis rails had a um, hundred kilograms of cement concrete but bigger problem um, in between the chassis rails just to keep the thing on the ground and give it some ballast um, Brian was very touchy when I asked him about the fact that they were really were they really nothing more than a motorized bowling ball um, he said they were more stable than that but he wouldn't I don't think what I heard 30 miles an hour and anything over that was a good idea um, but they did weigh I think they weighed 750 kilos so they were quite a substantial little thing um, Brian reckoned they could do 80 miles an hour but that would take a lot braver man than me to do that I would think um, of the six made Brian owns one, um, still owns one, as well as the prototype. Uh, there's one at the National Motor Museum in Bewley. Outspan organisation own, still owns three of them. And then there was a mysterious yellow one. Um, was that an Outspan lemon? I didn't think they did lemons anyway, but never mind. A yellow one that went to South Africa and as far as anyone knows is still there. But the, the best thing about that was the, the little, the little, the little cars, they, the, whatever they, you could describe them as. They really put smiles on people's faces, and undoubtedly did help outspan sell. Well, they helped sell. I think they helped greengrocers sell oranges, um, as is probably the main pertinent point. But outspan claimed to sold ex, millions of extra outspans, and I think everybody involved really was 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 proud of what was achieved with it really um even brian even got into the sunday times magazine as a result of the sun um the the, the span cars um I, I always remember actually 90 god blimey it must be about 1986 i was driving south on the a23 um in surrey coolsden hooley just before um, the M25 comes in. I mean, that big part, the M23. The start of the M23 there. And I was going, uh, I needed some fuel. So I stopped at the last petrol station before the M23. And I was turning across traffic. A very dark night, I remember. And uh, I was stopped. Um, uh, an orange stopped to let me go. And... Uh, Kind of scratched my head, a little bit bemused, and then behind it, lo and behold, were two more oranges. So, yeah, I was still scratching my head when I paid the chap in the petrol station, and um, he said, did you see those oranges? And I said, yeah, I did. It wasn't just me then. But anyway, that was quite funny at the time. I guess you had to be there, but um, that was quite funny. Um, So I think the message was they were very well engineered. Uh, there was die cast models of them made. So someone made some serious money out of that. And it certainly wasn't from what I can gather. Um, Brian. Um, after life after um, Outspan Oranges for Brian, he, he became quite well known for nice line in Ford Escort engine conversions where he'd stick V8s and Ford V6s into them. Much like um, a chap that he used to work with at uh, John Wilman, uh, Jeff Ewan, later of Race Proved, had done with his full conversions. He also did at least one special Ford Transit Van conversion, which had an SX V6 in it and uh, was pretty rapid and turned a few heads. Um... And he still, I think, until fairly recently, was getting fan letters on those, certainly from Japan, people writing to him just simply as to the man who who makes oranges, England. After that, he, um, ABS, run by Sir John Samuel, wanted Brian to design an electric vehicle in the late 70s. Uh, he built a pro he duly built a prototype, but that project now never got off the ground. And then is is something he's really very proud of. There was a thing it was called the car chair, which effectively was a way for 
disabled people to um, gain entry or or get into a car. Um, it was like a like a cradle type effort that kept that retained their dignity um, and was a very clever piece of kit. I think he sold a few of them. I don't even I don't even know if he sold that project on, but um, that was something um, he was very pleased or pleased about. Um, I think actually it was a management buyout from that. And then, then Brian got into um, something that got him a lot of publicity. He would noticed um, in, in the US, in particularly around the Nebraska area, there were some um, houses made from straw, straw bales. And that intrigued him. And he decided to create his, his own and offer them in kit form, much like Hoof and others do in Germany, although they don't use straw bales. So he set about designing a house that just happened to be made from straw bales. A very pretty looking house, actually. Um, that was in Smarden in Kent. Um, and that acted as his show home, indeed. And apparently he, he told me that they were popular in Nebraska, um, certain parts of Nebraska where there aren't many trees. Uh, and um, so therefore plenty of straw. Um, he was convinced and is convinced of the strength of these things and, and, and um, the, 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 you know, the, the beauty of the concept and sold quite a few uh, over the years. Although most of them went overseas. I think 60% were sold into Germany um, and Austria. Oh, Austria was also another very um, big sort of um, destination for Brian's houses. Um, you can still um, look at that website for that. That's, um, that's at Straw Bale House, strawbalehouse.co.uk. Although I was amused to see that I think Brian, well, Brian sold that um, house building project on um, to a, to another construct, well, to a construction company. And what I found very delicious and delightful was that he hasn't just sold it to, <coughs> excuse me, Acme Construction or AB a, a Construction. He sold it to a company, and wait for this. Um, a company called Huff and Puff Construction. Now that is a fantastic name, as far as I'm concerned. And I think you can find them on on the web. And I should have checked. I think it's HuffandPuff.co.uk. But Google Straw Bale House or Huff and Huff and Puff Construction, who are the current makers of Brian Waits Straw Bale Houses. I think you'll be pretty surprised when you see the images on the side of those houses but anyway that's um that's an, um, a fun little episode on a fun little car and a very serious designer and a talented one at that and um if you've enjoyed this episode and you've got this far 23 well minutes in you, uh, if you haven't subscribed already could you please do so that will help us greatly and if you um, could also hit that like button, that helps out the, the site's algorithm and puts us in to the feeds of, of more like-minded people like us who enjoy specialist and kit cars. If you're new around here and you've enjoyed this one, then that's great. I'm really pleased and thank you for visiting. And regardless of how many times you visited the, the, the channel, Thank you so much for giving up, giving up a piece of your piece of well time of your day, a, a part of your day to listen to our channel. And I hope you enjoy the other episodes um, that we've already got on there, and indeed in the future, and we've got plenty of good stuff. Well, I think out there, good stuff upcoming in the History Files um, series, and uh, that's about it for today. So thank you so much for visiting. Oh, while I remember. We do these videos in, in association with Neil Winnington's Enwin Motors channel. If you could um, 
spare an extra five minutes um, and head over to Neil's channel and do what I asked you to do here. I'll be very, very grateful. And so would Neil. And it just enables us to do a little bit more that we want to do, really, and, and gives us confidence, indeed, that um, we're on the right path with these these videos. So, as I say, wherever you are in the world, whatever you're doing, whatever time of day it is, thanks for visiting. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and uh, I look forward to welcoming you again soon. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to a brand new collaboration between Enwin's Motors YouTube channel and the TKC Magazine YouTube channel. Now, those of you familiar with the channels, and if you're watching this on Patreon, surely you are, will know that we've had a lot of success with our History File series, where we take the magazine's extensive photo archive and provide voiceover to explain the stories of some of the cars and the manufacturers and the people of the industry in the past that helped to make the industry we have today. Well, what we're doing on this series is a similar thing using the video archive from both channels to create more extensive videos on various cars or types of cars. By combining the video archive from both channels, we can actually show a little bit more to our individual Patreon supporters than you would get from one of the channels individually. Moreover, after 12 months, this will then filter onto YouTube. So if you're watching this on YouTube, there are another 11 episodes waiting for you on Patreon. So if you enjoyed it, then why not go to one of the Patreon pages for Enwins Motors or TKC Magazine and catch up on the rest. Anyway, without further ado, here is this month's video. Thank <laughs> you.